I want us to uh, start immediately and get into this topic in this series, which we're going to do the whole month on the Holy Spirit. Um, and maybe a little bit further, we'll see how it goes. But this, the subject is so vast and it is, um, it, we can never unfold it even in a year. It is the person of the Holy Spirit. He is a real person. It is the person that is available to us right now in the dispensation that we live. I want to make this clear that the Father, God, meaning God Himself, was operating and moving in the Old Testament. And His Spirit was upon some, was upon kings, prophets, and priests. Are you guys with me? And then we see, coming into the New Testament, just before, when it gets into the transition, we see Jesus walking on the earth. And we see Jesus moving and operating, and no longer the Father. And then Jesus makes these words. He says, if I do not go, I cannot send you the comforter. If I, can, if I do not go to be with my Father, I cannot send you the Holy Ghost. Meaning, by His statement He made there, there can only be one operating. Either the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit as a rule. Are you guys with me? Jesus said the Holy Spirit cannot come unless I go to be with my Father. Now the dynamics and the technicalities behind that principle or truth, we don't know. But we just know that is how it operates. So we see the Father operating in the Old Testament. We see Jesus walking, which the Bible says that if we want to know how the Father looks like, we look at the life of Jesus Christ. And then we see Jesus leaving and the Holy Spirit coming. And the Bible says that whatever the Holy Spirit speaks... He will testify of Jesus. Are you guys with me? Meaning that where there's an encounter with the Holy Ghost, when He moves, when He's in a service, people will give their lives to the Lord. That is the result. He will testify. Everything of Him will speak of Jesus Christ. So Jesus speaks of the Father. He says, if you look at me, you have seen the Father. The Holy Spirit is saying, if you look at me, if you see me, if you hear me speak, I testify and I witness of Jesus Christ. Are you guys with me? This I want to bring in as a foundation because a lot of people has confused who the Holy Spirit is or what His workings is. And I've seen it perverted in churches. I've seen it taken out of context. I've seen it exaggerated. I've seen the flesh operate. I've seen emotions operate. Everything except the Holy Spirit. My wife and I last year, and it was around September, October, we did a huge sacrifice which nobody knows about or anything like that. And uh, they don't need to. But we made a sacrifice. <clears throat> and as we did it, and it was something that we dearly loved. And the Lord said to me that the moment that you do it, He said, you will see how I'll expand your borders. He said, broadcasting will double, triple. I'll expand borders, stages everywhere. Instantly. And the moment we did it, it is putting your Isaac on the, on the altar. Are you guys with me? And um, God answers sacrifice by fire. He always does. And He will always demand something from you before He expands you. I'm going to say it again. He will always demand something from you to expand you or to make you bigger. But everything starts with a relationship with, say with me, the Holy Ghost. He is the most important person right now to talk about. He's the most important person for me in the Bible apart from Jesus. But they are one and the same and they are different. Are you guys with me? And I'm not going to get into how the Trinity operates or the, how the Trinity works. But, uh, uh, um, you know, so, so, so God has really done a lot, of, a lot of things for us in terms of where He's just expanded from January immediately. We have many multiple different of platforms. And when I say 1,000 people, I exclude TV. I exclude all those um, other things, which I think is just hugely exaggerated sometimes, but uh, most of the times. But um, uh, we, we, you know, that is just pure direct influence that God has done. We have seen our videos go viral in... Uh, we will just do one or two video on a, um, 
on a, uh, I, th I think it was the beginning of January or, or before January started, and it would thanks, and it would go to about 500,000, 600,000 views, and then videos constantly from there on would go 200,000. Uh, but God began to increase. We got, in, I think, I got so many invites from Australia and people from and the United States, and obviously we don't take any of them, uh, but. Um, uh, the news have spread and uh, God is establishing the prophetic for the very first time really and uh, no, no, let me not say that otherwise we get into trouble again but uh, 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 you know one of the first times in, uh, in South Africa where you know uh, I think it was Apostle Neville made a statement or something that was true or he said that you know a lot of prophets left uh, South Africa a lot you know, when I speak to people and I say, they ask me, how many prophets do I know? If I speak to other prophets in other nations, I say, I say, maybe one or two. And then they're like, you know, then they think I have an Elijah syndrome. And it is, it, people really, the prophets leave the nation. And when prophets leave a nation, prosperity leaves a nation. I want you to understand that God's operator, uh, 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 God's, uh, let me say it like, rather like this, God's uh, motives uh, of operandi is, um, is, is the prophetic when it comes to prosperity. He makes it very clear. He says, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe in His prophets and you shall prosper. It is a grace gift. There's nothing. It is the fivefold that is needed in the church. We need both the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher for the church to become mature. Are you guys with me? And once one of them are missing or two is missing, the church cannot come to its full maturity. That is why I have somebody like Apostle Neville who is an apostle. I'm not an apostle. Uh, 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 God can change offices and He can do those things. That's normal. But I have Him here. Why? To help establish us the church. Are you guys with me? He's one of the, he's one of the few men that I recognize in South Africa. And um, <laughs> say with you the Holy Ghost. Let's get into this. Let's say it with you again. Say the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit is one and the same. It is, He is one and the same. He is a person of the Godhead, not an it. He is not a ghost per se. It is just the King James Version calls Him a ghost because it's coming from the, uh, it's coming from the Greek and Hebrew word, which means uh, breath. Are you guys with me? In the Hebrew, it means ruach. In, uh, in Latin, it means spiritos which means, literally it means breath. The Greek word means breath. Are you guys with me? So, demons, every, word, every time you see the word spirit in the Bible, it means breath. That is why many times demons will come out by breath. That is why many times we'll breathe. The Bible says that Jesus breathed on His disciples and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, power was given to them, attributed to them, to go and cast out demons and heal the sick. Every time you are filled with the Holy Spirit, there will be signs, wonders, and miracles that will follow you. There is a difference with the Spirit upon you and the Spirit within you. Are you guys with me? In the conference, we experience the power of the Holy Ghost. But in this month, I want us to experience the manifest, say with me, presence. There is a difference. You have the person of Jesus Christ, the personhood. That is when Jesus walks into your room as a person. It happens. Be hungry and it will happen. He will walk in like a person into your room. Stand in front of you and begin to speak to you. That is how many Muslims getting saved. That is the personhood of Jesus Christ. Then you have the glory of God. It is a different manifestation. It is where in, we see in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 6, where the Bible says that I saw, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. And the word filled there means to be filling over and over and over, which means His clothing, His robe, which is His glory, filled the temple continually like smoke and bow, uh, 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 billows of smoke continually over and over. Once His glory comes in, it continues to increase. Are you guys with me? So we've experienced the glory. We've seen it even in conferences, all our conferences we do. Then you have the power of the Holy Spirit which is hidden in a certain place. Now the power of the Holy Spirit is when the Spirit is upon someone. 
Are you guys with me? So there are three realms to the Holy Spirit. He can be in you, He can be upon you, or He can be with you. I'm going to say it again. He can be in you, or He can be upon you, or He can be with you, according to Scripture. Those are the three areas where the Holy Spirit dwells when it comes to you as an individual. What is in you? In salvation, He comes inside of you. But He's not activated. Are you guys with me? He is not activated. I don't want to say He's dormant. Let me say He's dormant. I don't want to say He's dead. Let me rather say He's dormant. He is not activated. It means He is there, you're saved, and you're going to heaven. But there's no power flowing out of your hands. You cannot lay hands on the sick to get them healed. You cannot cast out devils. I mean, we saw so many demons leaving during the conference, especially in Centurion. I realized, okay, we're in Kruger's door. We'll still have to break the heavens open in that area. It's very difficult because what, what do we do? We come into a, into a stronghold, into a city, and you have to break principalities down. Until once the thing is down, you're going to see demons manifesting everywhere. I promise you. In St. Children, I think we did like 30 deliverances on Monday night. Or Tuesday. When did I preach? Sunday night. Sunday night. 30 deliverances. Just like all over the show. And demons were hiding, but they couldn't hide in the presence of God there. Now, when a city is kind of like you're still breaking through, it usually takes three years. You don't really see demon manifestations. Because the devil is not yet fully exposed. I, now we've seen one or two or so, but I'm, I'm, speaking of a, I'm speaking of a mass deliverance taking place. That the devil knows that territory has been taken from him. That is when you begin to cast out devils on a very frequent basis. Now that is done under the power of the Holy Spirit being upon you. Say with me, upon. Then there's a third realm where the Holy Ghost is with you. You see, when He is upon you, you can preach under an anointing. You can lay hands, cast out devils, heal the sick. You, that's when you begin to speak in other tongues. When the Holy Spirit is in you, you cannot pray in other tongues. When He comes upon you, He baptizes you. And you begin to pray in other tongues. Are you guys with me? Now you take the tongues and you have the ability to keep on praying. And praying. And the more you pray in other tongues, it is like a power generator that builds up in you. That whoever you meet during the day, you have the ability through the Holy Spirit to change their life. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to say it again. Because the church has confused emotions for the Spirit. And the soul for the Spirit. They move in soul power and not in spiritual power. Spiritual power comes from a place called prayer and the secret place. The more time you spend with God... The more time you spend in the secret place, on your knees, alone, with no distraction, it is the presence. It is there where His power is hidden. Are you guys with me? Then we get to the third realm. Say with me, with. So now the Holy Ghost is with you. When He is with you, it is when you can walk into a room and the atmosphere changes. He is with you. He walks in with you. You have the ability to sit in a business meeting and people can feel and sense, but something is, is different around you. There is what we call the uh, 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 residue of an encounter. That you can be in a conference such as when we were now, and it can be a powerful manifestation. And then there's that glory and that Holy Spirit that still stays on you for two days. It's the residue of the Spirit. And it's like you can talk to people and they say, but something is different. And in three days, four days, all of a sudden you're back to normal. Because God lifts. Are you guys with me? But there's a place to come where He remains on you. Let me, let me get a scripture quickly. I think it is in John. 
go so long for me to John. Let me get it now. Yeah, I think it is John. Go with me to John 1, verse uh, 32. Let me try 32. Yes, listen to this. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. Say with me, like a dove. Now maybe next week or so we'll get into this. There's a big difference between a pigeon and a dove. And a lot of people have confused the Holy Spirit. A dove is a sensitive animal. A pigeon is a rough animal. And you'll see the similarities where the church has begun to confuse the Holy Spirit for a fake Holy Spirit. What I mean by fake Holy Spirit? Emotions, soul power, noise, but not spiritual power. What does spiritual power do? If there's a devil, the devil manifests. When there's the sick, they get healed. What does emotions do? It hypes up, but there's no change. Are you guys with me? So, so listen to this. And John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained, say with he remained upon him. He didn't stay for a day or two. The Holy Spirit remained upon Jesus, that wherever he went, people could sense the presence tangibly on him. When he was walking, they could feel, but wait, something is, the, there, was, it, or there was a presence and a power remaining on him. There's a place where you and I can get, where the Holy Ghost will remain upon you, where his residue is not lifted. Are you guys with me? I shared in a story a lot of times, we, even when we were in uh, Namibia, and there was times when, and listen, what does that take? It takes a sacrifice life. That's why only 1% of Christians, or 0.5%, why does 0.1% have it? I'm speaking about His manifest presence, not His presence. We all have His presence, but some have even lost His presence. I'm going to share with you. That's what we're going to get into now. Are you guys with me? But I'm, what am I speaking? His manifest presence. It takes a sensitivity in you to cause Him to remain upon you. People's lives can only be changed by the Spirit being remained upon you. It takes a sacrifice life. Somebody that says, they'll, and, 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 and I'll get into it in the sermon, but somebody that says, from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed, what am I doing that's pleasing to God? What am I doing that's offending Him? He can get offended. God can get offended. We'll get into these things the whole month. There's a lot of scriptures for it. He is a person. Everything that you can do, God can do. You're made in His image. If you have feelings, God has feelings. Are you guys with me? In fact, the Bible says we can grieve His Holy Spirit. The word grieve means to hurt His feelings. And He's the most sensitive person that there is. Just by a wrong word, I'm speaking of His manifest presence lifts. I'm not saying His inward presence which is in you. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost. But His manifest presence lifts from you. Why? He's looking for a sensitivity. A person that represents... And walks or speak or talk or minister to people the way Christ has. Are you guys with me? Um, say with me sensitivity. So what does it take? It takes a sacrifice life. A life, I remember there was a season, we fast, I fasted a lot. And uh, I had to go through a season where I had to get my body healthy, where, where I had to stop doing that. Um, but I remember when we, we fasted, we fasted a lot. There would be so much power and presence. It doesn't matter where you are, demons would manifest. Because the moment you fast, light comes on you. The light of God. And everything that is in darkness must be exposed. But I'm speaking of a sacrifice life. 
Christians can't even pray in a sacrifice manner. We're not even speaking. Let's leave fasting out of the equation. Are you guys with me? I'm just speaking of having the ability to get on our knees and just pray for two hours or seek His face and spend time in the secret place. Not even prayer, because let me give you a secret. Prayer is not powerful. Or let me rather say different. There's no power in prayer. Are you guys with me? I know it might shock some of you. But let me say it again. There's no power in prayer. There's power in relationship. Hindus pray. Muslims pray. And they can't do anything in the spirit. In the spirit. Christians pray. And they can't do anything. There's no power in prayer. There's power in connection and relationship. The moment you walk into your prayer room, is there a connection where you know that your spirit is immediately connecting with God? And you have the ability to commune and fellowship with Him. Where you can sit and your heart is open, your spirit is open. And you're not just getting in and saying, let me just pray in tongues, and you're just making a noise. No, no, no. There's a realm where you can get where your words become more defined. I don't know if you guys understand what I'm saying. You might go from and just making a noise, praying in tongues and your tongues that you get, and that's okay. And then it gets to a place where you or you begin to worship and you begin to worship and you sing in tongues and you talk to the Lord. But there's a place of communion. It is the place where the power of God is hidden. There's no power unless you get to that realm. Are you guys with me? That is why when you see somebody moving in the supernatural as a preacher, you must know they've touched that realm. And it is available for every person. It'll change your life. He will change your life. His name is Holy Ghost. Once He comes upon you, you will feel Him, you will sense Him. He is good. Let me, say, let me say something controversial. When His manifest presence is on you, there will be goosebumps. There will be pins and needles. There will be like electricity over your body. It will feel like showers running down on you. It is His presence. Get into that place on your own. Are you guys with me? Have your seats. Have your seats. It is where you wait upon the Lord. Say with me, be still. And know that I am God. The scripture doesn't say be quiet. Quietness is in the flesh. Stillness is in the spirit. I'm going to say again. Quietness is in the flesh. Stillness is something that is spiritual in you. It is where your spirit has the ability to become still. You can be in a place, in a train station, in a, in, a, in a mall, but your spirit has the ability to become still. When I say surrender, healed. When I say to the church, raise your hand, surrender to him. What am I saying? St- become still in your spirit. You can sing, but your spirit has to remember. Your spiritual man is here and you are here. It's two different people. We were doing deliverance on a lady. Uh, it was during the week in, 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 at, at Centurion. And this is the first time I experienced this. I went on a 40-day water fast. And I was doing deliverance on a person that tried to come and kill me. And we're doing a session on him. A very big military guy, and I've shared the story before. But uh, something happened there. I can't remember. No, it wasn't that one. No, it wasn't that one. Sorry. It was the same period, but it was another person. It was another individual. We're doing d- deliverance, and I was on a 40-day water fast, and something happened to me. I all of a sudden became another person in me while my person, me, is still here. And I don't know how to explain it. They'll probably call me a witch again if I say this. But I felt a hand coming out of me, which was my hand, but yet my hand was here. And I felt a hand coming out of me like this. And have the ability to grab the person and do deliverance on them and pull a demon out. And then I realized the difference between a spiritual man and a natural man. 
that we have that our spirit man has eyes of its understanding. It has a mouth to speak. It has hands and feet. That's why Paul says, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But such a man was caught up into the third heaven, seeing such visions and revelations and things that it is unlawful for me to even utter what I've seen, seen he said. So there was another body in a body. There was a spiritual body in a body. Are you guys with me? What are angels made up of? Light, ethereal light. Let, let's leave that for another thing. What is your spirit man made up of the same substance? So the more light you get in you, which is found in the secret place through fasting and prayer, you build up your spirit man. And in this deliverance, like I said, a hand came out of him, my hand, because I was just, all of a sudden I had the ability to move somebody else inside of me. You see, the Bible says when the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Saul, he was changed into another man, and he began to prophesy. But when the Holy Spirit rushed upon him, he was changed into another man. Into what other man? The man that God has called him before, his spiritual man. And in a week we were doing deliverance, we were laying hands, I think it was Tuesday night, I was, I was doing deliverance on somebody. And the moment we laid hands, I felt... There's a way, I don't want to lose my train of thought now. Uh, uh, then I detected, but wait, you know. And like I said, devils hide because they come into a church. You can lay hands, they'll fall over nicely. And they'll stand up. And you cannot see them unless you have light. Uh, they'll look like a normal person. They'll even smile. They'll fall under the anointing. They'll shake. But there's a devil hiding. The only thing that exposes it is light. And I remember I laid hands, and as I wanted to move on to the next person, something came out of me, which, let me explain to you, as I just did, and grabbed this person again, and I felt, but, and, and this person was standing there. And as I did, I saw the face changing. As that happened, I saw the face changing, and I'm like, there's the demon. And we did deliverance. But what does it take? It takes, you know, as I said, we went through these seasons of fasting where you build up your spirit, man. No Christian can survive without fasting, prayer, or giving, or the word. You cannot. You do those things, you become a threefold court. Are you guys with me? Otherwise, you'll be a nominal Christian. This is where I wanted to get. Otherwise, you'll become a nominal Christian just going through the motions and so many church members are uh, coming to church and they go through the motions they go through the motions it is not it is possible for the presence of God to be in a place and not know it it is also possible for the presence of God to have departed and not know it are you guys with me go with you to Judges 16 verse 20 if yeah go to Judges 16 verse 20 so long but let me say this there's no power in prayer Say with me, relationship. How do you connect with God when you're in your inner room? How do you spend time with Him? What I'm telling you now, not 2% of Christians are doing. And then we wonder, but why is, is this failing and that failing? And nobody likes us and there's no favor. The more you spend time with God, the more you will smell like Him, look like Him. People will be attracted to you. They were attracted to Jesus all over the place. Are you guys with me? So only 2% of Christians, in fact, it was proven 1 to 2%, 98% of believers has never experienced the manifest presence of God. The manifest presence. So I told you, you have the glory, you've got the personhood, you have the power. Then you have the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. But then you have a realm which is called the manifest presence. It is deeper, it is in you, but it is so real, I don't know how to explain it. It's not the glory. It's not the anointing and it's not the power. It is, you will know it is the Holy Ghost. That when He comes upon you, you will not, you will feel electricity all over your body. You'll feel your spirit being fulfilled instantly. 
Many people walk with an emptiness in their spirit and their hearts. They'll say, it feels like my heart is empty or it feels like I'm missing something. It's the Holy Ghost. He's the only one that is the fullness of God that can fill you. Are you guys with me? So, so many churches has, unfortunately, replaced a dove with a pigeon. And they think they have the Holy Ghost, but they don't. He has left them. And they do not know it. And I'll show you out of Scripture now. Are you guys with me? So they're practicing the presence of God. Let's get, let's get into this. So what, I, what was I just, that wasn't even the sermon. And the uh, sermon will be short. It'll just be a part for today. And uh, we're going to carry on tonight and minister to you tonight. But it is the practicing of the presence that I was speaking now. You cannot even try to preach without that. Yet there are preachers who preach who has never even experienced the Holy Ghost. Are you guys with me? You know, I'm not impressed by, uh, by people's accolades or this or that. As I said, unfortunately, I can't say on life what has just happened the last two years from people wanting to sue us to then embracing us to this and to that and to, and I unfortunately can't say the details, you know. And then you have ministers singing your praises and the next moment they'll attack you and the next moment, and that you listen, not everybody's the f- flavor of the month every month. And when you are, don't think you are, uh, you know, it's like when Jesus rides the donkey, uh, the donkey think he's special because everybody is singing Hosanna to the king. And they're singing it for Jesus, not for the donkey. And, uh, uh, you know, we have been, I have been through there where we have been accepted in the whole country many years ago, preaching everywhere. Everybody loves you. And then the next time, they, they all hate you. And then they love you again, and then they hate you again. And now they're the place where they might love us again. You know what? Trust me, we've been through them all. The praises of people. Uh, well, let me say it like this. The Apostle Paul said, if I, if I still have to be um, wanting the praises of men, I will not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. If I still want to please man, I would, still, I would not no longer be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And uh, when it comes to all the people singing accolade, uh, accolades or this or that, and I know what it is most of them, 95% of the time it's just because we have no numbers. Somebody invited me. Uh, I said, let me tell you something. I said, I hope that you're not inviting me a second time or so. I said, I hope you're not inviting me because of our numbers. They just went silent. I said, what if I go on and there's now no numbers? I said, are you inviting me for the gift? And because God said so, are you inviting me for the numbers? I've been through ministry, blah, blah. That's why I stuck by encounter. If I'm hungry and desperate, I'll be taking every invite I get out there. Trust me, I get a lot. In fact, people don't even bother anymore because I literally don't answer. My assignment is encounter, and that is it for now. You know, so, um, uh, and the best way to win souls, the best evangelistic way is to plant churches successful churches it's the best way a lot of people think it's crusades here and there. that doesn't work if i ask you how many of you got saved in a crusade maybe one person will put up their hand here are you guys with me how many got saved in a crusade raise your hand not one so why must we do crusades i'm just saying i'm not saying it's bad but if i ask you how many of you got saved through a church everyone will put up their hands Because church planting is your most effective way of winning souls. So that is why we do church planting. But I do it that slow because there's a momentum. There's a snowball effect. A lot of people, I've seen them try to rush it in the beginning and they burn themselves out. I've seen friends of mine or other associates in the ministry would rather say like that. Planting branches all over. They planted 30 branches and all 30 are gone. You know. Because uh, it's, it's a waste. Rather wait until you raise up people and those people are ready. And then you plant branches. And that, is, that was Jesus' model. So, so listen, let's, 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 let, you know, let, me, let, me, just, let me just say, uh, let me just say this. Um, what do I mean by spiritual power and emotional power? And I want to lay a foundation. That's why I'm not getting to the sermon, but I'll get to it now. We've got a few minutes left. Say with me spiritual power. 
Say soulish power. People think faith is a confession only. And they think, but if I speak this, speak this, speak this, speak this, then it will be fine. I, I, I knew a minister's wife. Well, I, I knew at least three minister's wives. Uh, but I had one situation where a minister's wife who passed away from cancer. Um, and uh, I remember we said, go to chemo. And uh, they said, no, 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 no. By stripes, I'm healed. No, no, they said, uh, God has given me a promise. I said, okay. But saying it shakingly in the voice and saying, no, by stripes, I'm healed. By stripes, I'm healed. And by stripes, I'm healed the whole time. But something was lacking. We kept saying, go to chemo. Go do this thing. It's not a sin. Are you guys with me? And then the person passed away. Now, where was their faith? And what are people thinking who were around this person? You, and when they said, no, but you know, the Bible says this, so I must be healed. Not every promise in the Bible is for you. I'm going to say it again. Not if every promise in the Bible was for you, you would all be all be uh, wealthy. You would all be Abrams and Isaacs, or you'd be killed and slaughtered as well, because uh, that also comes with the territory. And uh, you must take every side of the Bible, okay? But it, it doesn't mean because we are all healed by stripes that that's his prom. That verse must become a life to you, and the Holy Spirit must bring it out. God must speak to you. That by that word, faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word, the rhema word, the spoken word of God. Meaning God speaks to you and said, I will heal you. And now you take that promise. And you can say, no, I'm not going to chemo because God said he's healing me. But you better know it is God. And then by that, faith comes. And a healing comes. But otherwise, it is a menial fake confession. That is a positive confession only. Faith is not hope. Faith is a substance and a measure. I'm going to say it again. Faith is not hope. Faith is a substance and a measure. It is a measure God gives you when He speaks to you. The moment His words are heard by you, a measure of faith is put in your spirit. And it is without a shadow of a doubt that you just know that you know, I am healed, or I will be blessed, or this thing is coming. But not every promise is for a person. Are you guys with me? We say, every place my foot shall tread, this land has been given unto me, and we stop right there. The Bible doesn't stop there. The Bible says, till the borders of this and the rivers of that, meaning there was an area, not every place your foot shall tread, just that place given to Joshua but the Holy Ghost can now bring it out to you and make it personal to you but you have the name it frame it claim it Christians that are saying every place my foot tread everything is given to me okay now why don't you have everything I'm speaking about the difference between soulish power and spiritual power it's time to get into a relationship with God where we know now how do we discern the difference we're going to get into it this month where you have the difference between the spirit and the soul. There's one thing that cuts between the spirit and the soul. Hebrews chapter number 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. For it cuts and divides between bone and marrow, the thoughts and intents of the hearts, and the spirit and soul. Are you guys with me? So I can pray, but if I pray without the word, there's not a division coming between my spirit and my soul. The moment there's a division between my spirit and my soul, I can move in spiritual power and no longer soulish power. But when there's not that division, when I don't have the word in my life, which I cannot get without the power of the Holy Spirit, once this is in, if I don't have this in me, there's a confusion between the soul and the spirit. And that is where you get Christians that battle to get set free or they come to church and they never changed. Are you guys with me? Listen to me. If you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit, this word is nothing but a normal book to you. 
you will read it and your hands will, in fact, it's worse than a normal book because it's all spiritual. It will make your hands close. You'll read one chapter and you'll just find your hands are closing it and you'll be like, you'll be like yawning and all of a sudden you'll be watching TV and you're going to realize, but why couldn't I read my Bible? Because it's a spiritual entity that will make a fleshly hands close it if you don't have the Holy Ghost. The author of this book is the Holy Ghost. Are you guys with me? So I need the author in my life to understand what it's saying here. How do I preach to you and just say to you, take a scripture and say, and the Holy Spirit remained upon him. It is Raymond revelation to me because I have the Holy Ghost in my life. If you say you, you, you're battling to read the word, you need the Holy Ghost. Are you guys with me? So let's, let's get into, so, so let, let, let's get into this. Let's get into this. Um, let's get into this and let me I'll start off the sermon and see where we'll, we'll go um, so the Holy Spirit being sensitive has the ability to depart from a person or not I'm speaking again of his manifest presence not salvation are you guys with me if you're saved you're saved you go to heaven miserable but you'll get there but while we are here, and the thing is, you will be poor in heaven, or you can be rich in heaven. Mm -hmm. Yes, all will be healthy, but you can be poor, or you can be rich, or you can shine as bright as a star, or you can be dark as people will look, and they'll even see no light on you in heaven. And the Bible says, the more we win souls, we will shine as bright as the stars on heaven. Meaning you'll stand in front of Reinhard Bonnke in heaven and you'll see somebody that is so bright you won't even be able to look at them because of the glory that will be given to them. Are you guys with me? You know, people confuse glory and honor and all these things and people, somebody wrote me a comment and say, you know, somebody wrote and said they honor us or they honor Apostle Neville. I can't remember somewhere. And somebody answered and says, no honor should be going to man. Listen, you're confusing glory and honor. God does not share his glory with anyone. In heaven, well, the, the Bible says Satan has a glory. Man has a glory and God has a glory. Glory simply means reputation. But let's speak about God's glory. He doesn't share it with anyone. No man will take the glory for himself. God will not allow that. But there is a place in scripture where even God can honor a man. And I'll show it for you. It's right throughout scripture. In fact, the Bible command us to honor one another. And esteem one another highly. It's a New Testament command. So in fact, the person's comment is actually in rebellion. Because if I'm humble and I would want to honor people, just honor them. You know, the Holy Spirit is welcomed by that. You know, when somebody, let's say like, and I just use a post level because well, he was here. If he's here, I try to serve him with everything I can. I'm lower than him. Why? I'm trying to honor him. I've got nothing to prove. I've got nothing to... I've, and people think I just met him yesterday or a year. We've been 15 years in relationship. 15 years where he's rebuked me. He's been a father figure to me. He doesn't mince his words. If he, if he says... I and mean, when he says something, it cuts you deep. But 15 years, if not longer, it might even be longer than 15 years. Um, but I choose to honor. And I choose to honor everybody. That, that comes because as Christians that is supposed to be our attitude but I don't have to honor religious people so somebody attacked me on Facebook I said hey I said I said they're like you're not like Jesus I said I'm exactly like Jesus and you have pharisaical spirit I said the way I res I'm responding to you the way Jesus responded to Pharisees but again how do you you have to you know a pastor that is not spiritual a minister that is not spiritual bends to every need of the congregation, is scared of when they say this, scared of when they suggest this, or when they threaten them with this. And the congregation says, no, you must maybe preach on this. Or, oh, pastor, you know, you must watch out for this thing and that thing. Listen, we have not come to Kruger's Talk for those games. And you know it by now. That's the only way we can get to this city free. Because I've seen so many pastors in this city. They had no backbone. I'm not saying all of them. I say some where I've preached. They have no backbone and they lost their congregations. Some closed down. But can God leave? Go to be Judges 16 verse 20. There are two things that can happen. And 
either God can leave and we don't know it, or He can be present and we don't know it. And she said, listen to this, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. Say with me, shake myself free. Samson got into a place where he felt he could do it. I will go out like the other times and go beat them again. I will do it and I will shake myself free. And he forgot about God and the grace of God that was on his life that gave him the ability to do it. And it was, you know, we have this word, I'm a self-made millionaire. Oh, okay. So God was not in it. Are you guys with me? But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. This is one of the most saddest statements in Scripture. So, I'm getting to, an, and I want this month for us to, our hearts to be cut. Because I want us to realize that God can be missing from our lives and we don't know it. The Holy Ghost can be missing from our lives and we don't know it. Are you guys with me? When I got saved, I remember I went back to my home. It was about two weeks after my salvation. I got saved in a drug den. And uh, 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 got home. There were many people on drugs and so on in my house. And um, partying and so on. And I remember going to my room and I had to get people out of my room. It was everything. It was house, like a house party. I was probably 17 or so. And I went to... And I just remember closing my room and I tried to look for a Bible. It was the first night I was saved. I tried to look for a Bible. I just sat in my bed and just read my Bible and I tried to pray. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden the Holy Ghost came on me and I began to pray in tongues. Then, then it was about a week or two weeks after that, I began to understand. Three weeks after that, I got invited to a church and I went to a church and then I began to fast. And I wasn't on a long fast, like 21, well, I was considering 21 day water fast. And, um, and I'll never forget, I was living in an outside room. And I had so many demons in my life. Uh, I mean, somebody that's in our church, they slept over by my house that night. And we heard this knock on the door. And I said to him, open, you know, we used to open it, those tin doors, you know, the outside room, the tin doors. And they opened the door, and there this demon is standing. They went, they didn't understand what, you know, like we got a shock. And uh, uh, when I said to you, I had a lot of demons, I had a lot of demons. If my friends, which one friend slept at my, in my room where I was praying so much, I wake up in the middle of the night, and the guy's floating like this. I, 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 st- I started waking up, and he dropped. The guy is Ian. Uh, he's not in our church here. He's in my, he's in my previous church. Um, we would pray and demons would attack our dogs. When I say revelation was not widespread, revelation was not widespread. There was no church really that moved in power outside maybe of Ramah and uh, Hatfield and that was about it. Maybe one or two others. So there was not, the, you hadn't had a, 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 a saturation of the presence of God. So it was a lot of demonic activity. But I remember beginning to fast and I was fasting in this room of mine, the outside room. I was praying for 20. I had nothing. I had not one magazine. I had the Bible. I had music. And I had my water. And that was it. And maybe a book I wrote in. And I was just praying and fasting. And I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor. And I slept for many years on a mattress on the floor, by the way. Uh, then in people's living room, then in a church, then in another person's living room, then in the outside room again, until I was about, I think, 23, 24. And... Uh, uh, then only was I able to gather a bit of money to, to get my own place. But I remember those times I would see God and this person walked into my room. I couldn't see him as in you would see Jesus walking in. I saw on a 40-day water force, I saw the feet of Jesus and his body. And as I walked, looked into his face, it was too bright. And I was taken. Many of you know that encounter. But this one, I saw this being walking in. But it was a person. It wasn't a floating in. A lot of people think the Holy Spirit is just a cloud coming in. It was a person walking in like this. And I remember I was sitting on my bed, and this person sat right next to my bed, and the bed went in as if you could see sitting like this. And I was sitting full of electricity, shaking. 
and a voice began to speak to me. And I went from scripture to scripture and, the, and, and took me. And I have all the scriptures written down in a book, in my first Bible, sorry, from Genesis to, uh, to Jeremiah. And that began to explain to my calling. He said to me, your family will reject you. This will reject you. Once you begin to move in the power of God, I've called you to take nations, but every minister will reject you. They'll try to take you and take your blood but you will survive. You will carry my power. I've called you as a prophet to the nations. And if, when I sat, sat there for an hour, probably more than an hour, that was probably, it felt like an hour to two hours, the voice was speaking and this person was sitting, which was the Holy Spirit. And that was one of the first nights, and I had about four encounters like that, where I can tell you, it's not a, I wonder if God touched me. God touched me. I was in a service. No, I was in a room. Um, I was in a room, in a hotel room, and there was a, and, and in South America, you had four revivalists who changed all of South America. They started the South American revival, which is the longest running revival in human history right now. Um, uh, one of their names was Claudius, uh, huh? Huh? Uh, Claudia Fritzen, but not that one. There was a, it was it was Claudia Fritzen, yeah. So you had yes, you had uh, Carlos Anacondia. These people would have a stadium, would have crusades, and the highways would have to be blocked off around it because the moment people would drive through, they would manifest, and the car would be an accident. I'm serious. It's documented. So they would have 40, 50, 100 to 50 thousand people. So there were four people. Sergio Scatiglini he sat in my service. Um, uh, Claudia Fritzen. Carlos Anacondia, and I have no idea who the other person was, but, huh? No, not him. No, he's small. Uh, um, so, so, it was, uh, it was not four, it was three. You started, it was those three I'm mentioning. And the one cloud has fritz, and he's got maybe three, four hundred thousand people. So they'll get the whole of Colombia saved, literally. Uh, um, uh, uh, or the main capital of Colombia, sorry, the main city of capital, Colombia. Uh, the Bogota, Bogota, Colombia, Bogota. The whole, do you know that every family in Colombia, Bogota, according to statistics, became Christians because of that revival? So that's where the, so this person did a service in South Africa. We met them. But I mean, they will say one word and you'll have thousands down in power. When I say, and then, so then eventually they went back and we were in a hotel room. It was me and another minister. And another person that's now with Rodney, uh, Rodney R. Brown, he's his worship leader. And it was me and a minister and, that, and him. We're sitting in the room and we made a Skype call to this person, Clara Freyton. And uh, the man sp spoke on, on, on Skype to us. He said, I think it was three or four words. It was six o'clock the evening. He just said these words. I remember he started off the prayer. He said, hallelujah. He says, may Jesus become real to you. And the moment he did it, when I say to you that power hit us for five hours, you don't fake five hours. The moment I try to get up from the floor, it feels like somebody's gripping your heart and that you will die in that presence. And then you begin to repent of every sin because they carry a, tip, a revival called the Holy Fire. It's a, it's a fire movement. It's fire. It's, it's, you repent of every sin. It's a fire that comes because the fire purges your heart. Okay, so... It's not the fire of God, how we think, just screaming. It's, it purges your heart of every sin. You repent of every sin, even everything that you just think you did. And uh, five hours, we get up. He's on Skype again. He prays again. We're down again for two hours. We only walked out of the hotel room about 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. And those were moments. Those were, uh, second, uh, 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 those were um, memorable moments that... Uh, I would always remember. Another one was in Namibia. Many of you have heard that. I'm not going to tell that testimony again. When I came into my room, God was, it was as if God was sitting like a burning bush on my bed. It's the only way I can explain it. Because something was burning on my bed. And I could not touch it. I could not get close to it. When I say it, I'm not meaning, the, the, uh, I'm, just, I'm just explaining to, to really explain the image of what was happening. And then I remember it struck me down. And the voice of the Lord came to me audibly. And said, if you do not get healthy, you will not carry the glory that I've called you to carry and take nations. And then from that moment, I was sick. I had to come back from Namibia. You know, uh, um, uh, it, was, it was, 
and it was such holiness. When I speak about holiness, you shake, you cannot get up. Now, those encounters you do not forget. You do not even question whether God is there or not. So when I say that we want a person of the Holy Ghost, that is what we want to press into. Are you guys with me? So, 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 so God can be present or not. Go through to Luke 2, 41, quickly. Luke 2, 41. Give me five minutes. We're going to finish. I'm not going to finish the sermon. We're going to carry on tonight. I'm going to pray for you tonight. Luke 2, verse 41. Luke 2, verse 41. And every Sunday, we're going to get more intense with the Holy Spirit, but I need to lay a foundation. I need you to be introduced to the person of the Holy Spirit. In the mornings, we cannot pray for you the way we want to when it comes to this dynamic, uh, unless God comes in and commands. But listen to this. His parents, is this 41? Listen to this. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. Listen, they were in a place where Jesus was with them all the time. And then he stayed behind and they thought he was still with them. And Christians can get to a place where they think Jesus is still with them, but He's no longer with them. Where the presence of God is with them, but He's no longer with them. Or where they think the cloud of the glory of God is with them, but the cloud has moved on. Are you guys with me? Let's carry on reading. So, but supposing Him to have been in the company that they were traveling, they went a day's journey and sought Him among their relatives and acquaintances. So they went a whole day without knowing that he was gone. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem. Say with me, returned. And we're going to get into these things this morning and tonight a bit. Seeking him. They realized the shock came on them. Our child is gone. I want you to, 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 to understand this. Imagine you go to the shop, you have children. And they're young, maybe four years old, five years old. And all of a sudden you get home and you realize you forgot your child at, at the shop. Imagine the fear and the shock that will hit you. The only problem is this happens to Christians, but it happens too late. And it happens when it is too late. And then they realize, I am far away from God. And then that fear comes into them and that shock comes into them. Because Jesus was left behind. Let's, go to verse, let's carry on verse 46. Now, so it was after these three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Listen to this. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? How, look at how she gets upset with him. And I'm going to get into these things maybe this morning, maybe tonight. How irritation is one of the things that grieves the Holy Ghost. When I'm irritable, it means I'm in the flesh and not in the spirit. Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Say with you anxiously. The first thing that comes to a person where the manifest presence of God has left them is anxiety. What happens when the manifest presence of God leaves a person? You'll see anxiety comes in. You'll see irritability comes in. You'll see complaining and murmuring, and we'll get into that just now coming in. And there are certain traits that comes into people when the manifest presence of God is no longer with them. Remember, say with me, with. So there's the Holy Ghost in, the Holy Ghost upon, and the Holy Ghost with you. This, the purpose of this whole month is to explain the presence of the Holy Ghost that can be with you. Are you guys with me? But we need a church that is hungry or that is open in their spirit, that is saying, I want more of this relationship. If I can preach and if I can get somebody that can just leave this place and say, you know what? I want more of what he was speaking about. You are on the right track and the right journey of getting him. When that notion is there, God begins to seek you. What do I mean by, listen, so what happens with Jesus, when he was with his parents, they were walking. And he was staying behind. 
their parents, his parents was walking that route every year. It was an annual feast they had to go to do an offering. Every year. So it was a place that was familiar. The moment we get familiar in a certain surrounding, or with a routine or a habit, it becomes tradition and the Holy Ghost leaves. When I get into my prayer room and every time I'm just praying my little prayer list and I'm doing my things, and then I think, oh, I've spent such a good time with God. God wasn't even there. Have you healed it to Him? Have you become still? Do you know how much peace you will have when that comes into your life? Peace is the evidence of God's manifest presence on you. That it doesn't matter what falls around, you don't move to the country of Cape Town. Because peace is governing your life. Are you guys with me? Peace is the Peace is the umpire of your heart. The peace that is upon your life, the Bible says, it surpasses all understanding. Well, others say, but you should be going anxious or you should be falling apart. You have a peace that surpasses all understanding because you have His manifest presence. You say, but I know a person who lives inside of me, but whom I'm with every single day. Listen here, this is a place where Jesus becomes more real to you than people that are sitting right next to you right now. That it doesn't matter where all things in this world begins to fade away, but and becomes dim, and the things of the Spirit becomes more real and becomes more visible. Are you guys with me? Have your seats, have your seats. So, so say with me, God can leave me without me knowing it. This is God departing from somebody without them knowing. Now let's go to Genesis uh, 28 verse 16. Almost finished. I know this is not the full sermon we're carrying on tonight. Genesis 28 16. Now there's another dynamic to this. The Holy Ghost can be in a place and you cannot know it. You can sit in the church here. And my words are just flying over your head because you have a fleshly head and you're thinking, what am I going to eat? What restaurant am I going to? Are they going to have this food or uh, this? And the, you know, I've prayed for people. When we pray for healing, sometimes God would tell me, or a person is not ready, and, a God, uh, and, and God would tell me, don't pray for them. They are not ready. They are not, they are not yet touched by Him. Because you pray for somebody in the flesh, it's like nothing happens. Are you guys with me? At least around you can go beyond it. If they have demons and so on, you can go beyond it. You don't care whether they submit or surrender or not. You can make, you can, you can make the demon manifest. But when it comes to healing, God will never, never impose His will upon someone or impose Himself upon somebody. And He's waiting for them to come into a place of yielding and being touched by Him. And when they've gone past the flesh into the realm of the spirit, they're ready to be touched. Are you guys with me? But when they're in the flesh, it's like it, 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 they just cannot understand. That's why you have to be in a place where I always try to make jokes or let people relax in a service. Because when you are anxious, you know some of these churches, they even scream if a baby cries. They, they, you, know, you can hear a needle drop. In that, now there's a place in the glory where children can't cry or stuff like that because the glory will kill you. <laughs> I've seen people die who would touch the presence of God. One Satanist tried to mess with us and some of my team was there. The man sitting in the church filming us with his whole group of all these Satanists and they're writing down everything about us, you know. And they switched off the lights and they tried to run forward with knives and all this stuff. And, and the high priest is sitting there. He was the owner of a certain nightclub that I'm not going to get into right now. Where they have a, a, um, they have a uh, uh, altar sacrifice underneath the club. Okay. And um, so he says, then he sends me a message. We were in a prayer meeting. Me and my team were praying at my house. No furniture or a little bit of furniture, but we were praying and the glory of God was there. And this angel appeared right next to me. And this angel is just standing here, just, just, just observing. And I'm thinking like, what is going, why is this angel here? That was the first thought that came to me. Why is this angel here? 
And this angel stood next to me. And all of a sudden, I get this message. And the person said, it goes off at me saying, I will kill your wife and I'll do this and da 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 with your family. So I just answered shortly back. I said, I, I said, you will breathe your last. I don't think I should have said that, but I said that. <laughs> and because I'm sensing an angel, eight months later, sitting in his room, knocked over dead, just stopped breathing. He couldn't find the cause of it. If you touch the glory or you touch something that interferes with the purpose of God and you don't repent and your intention is to harm because we're not the, they burned the, the church where they were at they burned that church down I want that church I said to the church I said your church will burn down uh, they just laughed at me a year later the church burns down what church burns down how do I guess that one they literally burned down the church are you guys with me? They were in the kids' church. They were everywhere. Satan has infiltrated that whole church. So, say with the discerning his presence. So the Lord can leave you without knowing. Or he can be present in a place without knowing. Listen to this. Genesis 28 verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Meaning, surely God is in this place. There can be some that is here sitting in the church. And maybe in a week or two weeks or three weeks, your eyes suddenly open. And you realize, oh my God, gosh, like God has been here for how long? The presence of God has been here. And I didn't know it. God can sit next to you or touch somebody next to you 30 centimeters away from you. And you can feel nothing because of flesh. Are you guys with me? Or religion, what religion has put into our minds, whether we come out of the Enchia or Roman Catholic, wherever we come out of, it has given a certain type of impression of who God is, which is not real. And then we are grown up by that history and we think this is how we, and when we get into this new style, we think, but this cannot be God. No, 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 no. God can use anyone, anytime. Say with me the Holy Ghost. Say with me practicing the presence of God. If there's one key I want to get through to you, it's to practice His presence. What is it to practice His presence? When you are in that place of prayer, and I'll close now in two minutes. When you are in that place of prayer, as I said, whether it's two hours, three hours, and we've preached on it many times, fasting. It is in that place where there's a stillness that comes into you. All of, you're in a room in your house and all of a sudden it feels like you're not hearing cars even driving past. Because your ears, your spiritual ears have opened up. And you're hearing another realm. You're not distracted by whether a notification comes to your phone because your eyes are seeing another realm. It is in that place where power is hidden. It is in that place where the practicing of the presence of God is. Are you guys with me? Madame Guyane. If many of you might know her, so actually not, but uh, she was somebody who practiced the presence of God. Where she would walk, people would get healed in a shadow. Um, uh, 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 Catherine Kuhlman the same but Madame Guyon was known for practicing the presence these people would just sit in a place and if people would just come walking past them they'll get healed are you guys with me? it's the manifest presence he can be entertained embraced and celebrated or he can be grieved and pushed away so now I don't want to get into the things of what happens when we have lost him and what grieves him. And we want to pray for you. Say with you the personhood of the Holy Spirit. He is a person. You must think of him as a person, not as an it. How do you entertain? How do you speak to him? He is the one that is with us currently, not Jesus. Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the, God, at the, right hand of the throne of God. Are you guys with me? Christ in you, the hope of glory. But Jesus is in heaven. And we're not separating Jesus and Christ. But it's the Holy Ghost that is with you right now. Meaning He's the one that we have a relationship with. He's the one that is testifying. It is as if He's Jesus in the flesh with us every single day. Jesus said, if I stay with you, I am limited. I can only be with 12 disciples. But the moment I go, I can send the Comforter who can be with every single one. So as Jesus walked with 12 disciples, 
The Holy Ghost is Jesus walking with you as if Jesus walked with the 12 disciples. I don't know if you understand with what I'm saying. If we can understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, how active He was, how active He was in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, how active He is today, your life will change. I dare you to even just ask the question when you're alone, to say, Holy Spirit, show me if you are real. And have your spirit in a place of stillness. I dare you to do that and see what happens. We serve a God that is alive, not dead, who can hear and is not deaf. When you pray that prayer, He will come into your room, whether it takes an hour, whether it takes five minutes, whether it takes two hours. He will come and trust me. If you sit and you be still and you call upon Him, even if it's the first time you ever do it, you will feel His presence coming into your life and you'll have an encounter. And He'll give you an encounter. And usually those encounters is just a taste of something that He has planned for you. It is a foretaste of something that God has destined for you. And He lets you taste it and just touch it. Are you guys with me? Let's stand to our feet wherever you are. And tonight we're going to go on and uh, we'll minister to you and pray for you. And you're going to see how the Holy Spirit is going to work and touch many. And I'm speaking of those are in a way of the manifest presence. Are you guys with me? I want everybody in here for me to close their eyes for me quickly. Everyone to close their eyes. Mm-hmm. If you're standing here, and it's very pivotal for me to do this prayer right now in the series that we are doing. You cannot, let me say it like this. The greatest gift you can give an unbeliever is Jesus. The greatest gift you can give a believer is the transformation through the Holy Spirit. And the greatest gift you can give a transformed believer is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Why do we lay hands sometimes? We are empowering people. Why are we preaching the word we, the way we do so that it can be transformed through the Holy Spirit? When mantles are put on you, when hands are laid upon you, it doesn't matter in what a manner it is done. It is the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. He empowers you to go do His work. But he receive in his hope, but none of that can start unless we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not speaking about an emotional thing that has happened or because of a religious church we got grown up into. And we just know, you know, I mean, if you get brought up in a religious church or a denominational church, you know Jesus died for you on the cross. You even believe in him, but you don't have a relationship with him. So please get that out of our heads. The Bible says, even the demons believe and tremble. Belief doesn't get us to heaven. Relationship does. Belief, even the demons believe in travel. Even the devil believes very well in God. Very, 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 I mean, he believes very strongly in God. Uh, that belief doesn't even, we believe in the devil. That doesn't mean we're going to hell. Belief just means that we believe it is happening. When I'm actually speaking of faith, it's a trust. It's putting your full assurance in somebody. It is having a relationship with him. And if you are with every eyes closed right now, if you are here and you and, and everything I've preached right now, none of it can happen unless it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you are here and you're saying, Leon, I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't have a relationship with God. I've been in church my whole life or I've known about these things, but I know in my heart I do not have a relationship with Him. I do not have the 100% assurance that if I have to die today, that heaven is my home. Can, I cannot stand and let somebody put a gun to my head and know that I'm safe in the hands of Jesus Christ and a full joy to, trace, to, to pass over and to step over to the other side, to graduate. Or maybe you're saying, you're saying, but or I, I have known the Lord. I have known Jesus Christ. I, I had a relationship with Him, but it dwindled away and I backslid. It's not as hot as it used to be. 
it's not on fire as it used to be. I have, my relationship with God has dwindled down. It's not right at the moment. And that has caused doubt to come in about my salvation. That I don't have the assurance also of where I'm going because I know my heart is, I'm not in the right place with Him right now. And all these promises I was sharing of the Holy Spirit and the encounters and the experiences, all of this can be for you. But it starts first with a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And with every eye closed, if you're saying right now, if you're saying, Leon, that is me. I don't have that full assurance whether heaven is my home. If I have to die today, that heaven is my home. I don't have that relationship with God where I have that hunger and I'm being pulled towards Him to spend time with Him. But I want to make it right, right now this morning as we're starting this series. If that is you, while every eye is closed, if you can raise your hands, just slip up your hand for me. I see that hand. Thank you very much. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you very much. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you very much. I'm going to be a few more seconds. If you're saying you will feel the Holy Spirit knocking in your heart's door, you'll feel, I see the hand. Thank you very much. You'll feel Him knocking in your heart's door. And it starts by relationship with God. Thank you very much. I see that hand. I see that hand. And as we're going to pray for you now, you're going to feel the Holy Spirit come upon you. I want to, everyone who has raised their hands, I want you to come to the front for me. Quickly, come here that I can pray for you personally. I want to shake your hand and pray for you. And uh, come on, church, let's give them a hand. If you have raised your hands, come to the front. And this is the greatest decision you can make. Come on, church, give Jesus. I have made this decision. Come forward, come forward, come forward. Come on, let's give Jesus a better hand. Let's Ushers, just help there. Ushers, just help, guys. Come, ushers. So, I want to say this. Nobody can accept Christ. What you're doing here, most in the church have done it. There are some still that hasn't done it. But not one Christian, no one can get to Christ except when they believe in their heart. But it doesn't stop there. It says, confess with their mouth. Are you guys with me? Even Paul was riding on the road of Damascus. The Bible says that Jesus knocked him off his horse. And he had this incredible encounter. But he had to get to one of the disciples. And God had to take him to a man. That's why this is so important. Because this is a, um, this is what you're doing right now. You believed in your heart while we, I was praying and talking to you just now. And now you're going to be confessing with your mouth and believe in your heart. And this is what brings salvation. Salvation doesn't come any other way. It doesn't come with me at home alone and just hoping in my heart that I'm saved. It doesn't work like that. God has put a certain order and a protocol in. That can be the start, but then He'll lead you to a church or He'll lead you to a place, to His body that it is required of where Jesus can be given to you from one person to another. And the prayer that you're going to pray in front right now is the same prayer. And I'm going to ask the whole church to pray with so that every one of us pray with. It's the same prayer I prayed in a drug den. One prayer that changed my life. One prayer that changed. It might take you 10 years, 15 years to grow into a relationship with God. You won't take as long as me because we were in times where it was tough. There was no real churches. There was no real revelation. People didn't speak on these things. Um, but one prayer, and it's never to be anything ashamed of. Meaning it is the bravest thing that you can do is to come out. The most courageous thing you can do is to come out. Many in this church have done the same. They have come out and answered this call at some point of time. And that is where your relationship with Jesus Christ starts. I want you to say in your heart right now that, and make it serious and talk to the Holy Spirit and say, this is where it starts. It is at this moment where I'm turning my life around, where I'm receiving the Holy Spirit and I'm starting my relationship with the Lord. And I'm going to pray for you right now. But just before I pray for you, after, I'm going to pray a prayer and I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And then after that, I'm going to then lay, just lay hands on you. Directly after that, somebody's going to walk with you just to give you a gift. But I want to ask you this, to read your Bible every day, even if it is one chapter, just one chapter, to read your Bible every day, to pray even if it's five minutes, to come to church and get into an e-group. That's the only way a person can grow in the relationship with God. You cannot do this thing on your own. And I've seen, I have seen 
thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands tens of thousands standing in the place where you're standing right now where I've ministered to them over the years and I've seen many backslidden and then I've seen some that would follow when they have a church that follows up on them so I want to ask you this to get committed uh, at, at least on a Sunday service an e-group and uh, read your Bible and pray that is it and know that is real I want you to pray this prayer with me I want to see everybody pray this prayer I want to see your lips move I want you to mean it in your heart mean it in your heart church stretch out your hands towards them and I want to ask the church to pray with me we're for them say with me say heavenly father in Jesus mighty name forgive me for a sinful lifestyle right now I believe that you are Lord of my life I believe that you died and have gone to heaven that you died upon the cross and you rose from the dead I believe and I receive the power of your blood in Jesus mighty name I receive today your Holy Spirit fill me with your Holy Spirit give me the gift of the Holy Spirit I want to start today a personal relationship with you in Jesus name I believe my sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ father I pray right now for each one of them I'm gonna come and lay hands on you just now father I pray for each one of them that the power of the blood of Jesus Christ will wash over them every devil will flee from them every bondage that has held them back will depart from their lives every chain that has held them back will be broken by the anointing oil in Jesus mighty name be filled somebody behind you that's going to just walk with you and give you a gift come on church let's give Jesus a praise offering one more time come on praise him praise him praise him Amen. Raise your hands, just raise your hands, raise your hands to the Lord. Father, I thank you for your presence. We thank you for the anointing, for the glory of God. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be with each one in this place. Let your presence not only be in us or upon us, but with us. I pray for tonight's service that the personhood of the Holy Spirit will enter this place and touch many hearts. And we give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.